All right. All right, all right, all right. So we're going to start or what? Nah, we so still the have a couple of more minutes. So the thing is, um, actually, when you uh, get the people um, into your room, you know, it's always like that. You no, know? everyone is just like sitting on their uh, chairs and, you know, they're in the room already, but uh, still the stage, uh, it's not empty. Everyone is sitting there and everyone is just, you know, making up stuff like, oh, we have to wait a couple of minutes when everyone is gathered. So the people who are already first and they are sitting there already, they're kind of like feeling awkward. Like what I'm doing here, everyone is already there and still it didn't really begin. So maybe we could play some games or do something. Tell some Yeah, jokes. you know, yeah, you know, the people have just some, a couple of minutes to get their coffee or tea or whatever, whatever they drink. So oh, okay. this rainy Monday. I got my uh, Yeah, because you're a professional. Yeah. Yeah. A cup of coffee wouldn't really hurt anyone today, I guess. So how about how about the weather, guys? Do you have you see rain outside? You know, in Moscow actually, uh it's not really that bad just right now, but still. Uh, I got so many trees around my house. So whenever it's summer, it's, it's always green, you know, outside right. of my window. It's so right. gr- it's so it's so beautiful. And then uh, when it's um, it's autumn, it's fall, and I've got red and yellow all around my window. And right now, it's just like winter. Um, <laughs> lots of branches and no leaves. And I'm like, ah. Uh... So it's gonna be snowing, yeah. Some yeah. Dark Souls vibes. Yeah. So, so we're yeah. at that time it's, of the it, year, it, yeah. it's poison swamps out there, <laughs> out of the window, you know. <laughs> so yeah, we already have a first question, which is: Is application to Game Drive still available? And yes, it is. Uh, you guys have time till tomorrow. Tomorrow is gonna to be the last day, but I'm gonna mention that once again a little bit later. Um. Yeah, I believe we can start. So please gather around for the final Game Drive AMA session, session number three. Uh, final, at least for this year. I hope so. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's get it on. Uh, hello, everyone. And welcome to the last Game Drive AMA session of this year during September. And October, we had three AMA sessions where we introduced a game drive campaign by My Games and Google, aimed to support mobile game developers from EMEA countries. And we have also discussed several aspects of game development, and I hope you've already watched all of these videos. Um, and before we start, here's an important thing to remind you, and we have already uh, mentioned that before, tomorrow, Tuesday 19th, will be the last day for applications. So please use your chance to submit your project today or tomorrow. And now, today we welcome you to our third and the last educational session in a series of Game Drive events open to everyone, really everyone, irrespective of the team size or experience level or whatever, who would like to learn more about mobile game development and publishing. My name, as usual, is Anton Gorodetsky, and I'm the head of Play One Media Project at My Games, and I will be your host today for the session. Uh, and of course, today's AMA is supported by our beautiful, dear, invited guests from two media channels. The first partner is the amazing guys from Zaftracast Media. Please hey, welcome. Hi. All right, please welcome <laughs> Maxim. Welcome on stage. Yeah, Maxim and Timur, who are streaming us today on their YouTube channel. We very much welcome the guys and their listeners and invite them to join the discussion in the comments section on the Zaftracast YouTube live stream chat. We're reviewing all the comments and will definitely answer all of your questions. So um, welcome, guys. Hi there, and we're Hi. really... We're really glad to be here and thanks for having us. And we really hope that uh, today's uh, AMA session and as well as educational part 
will be as interesting as uh, the two previous ones. They were really, really cool. And I hope it's going to be uh, living up to our expectations and yours as well, because actually there are lots of really cool data insights and case studies uh, uh, we had on the previous AMA sessions. And I would hope that it's going to be the same today. Yes, and I remind our viewers to ask away the questions if you have them. Don't be shy, don't be afraid. Write your questions both in Russian or in English. We will translate your Russian questions. There's no problem. Don't be shy, just ask away. All right, all right. I just love working with the guys. You you guys always know what to say, and thank you. And we also have our other partner, AT Level, a professional media outlet about game development who's also streaming us today on their YouTube channel. Hey, guys, and thank you for supporting us today. And of course, do not hesitate to ask your questions there as well. Yeah, before we start, let's go through a few technical details about the session. All our AMA sessions are in English. However, we also have a Russian simultaneous translation, so feel free to choose the language stream by clicking on the globe button at the bottom of your Zoom interface panel. Our speaker sessions will take approximately 40 minutes, and then we'll have another 40 minute, minute uh, Q&A session with you. So please, just as uh, Maxim and Timur have mentioned earlier, prepare your questions and do not hesitate to ask them by using either the Q&A chat option in the bottom panel of the Zoom interface, or to those who watch us on Zaftercast or A to Level YouTube channels, feel free to ask your questions right on the YouTube live stream chats. So we'll monitor them and try to answer during the session today. Finally, before we get to the speakers, for those of you who for some reason still do not know what Game Drive is, let me briefly explain the idea of the whole thing. Game Drive is a joint initiative created together by My Games and Google. This is a business acceleration campaign for mobile game developers, which is designed to help developers from EMEA countries, which is Europe, Middle East, and Africa, in the development, publishing, promotion, and scaling of their games. So basically, what do we offer to developers? First, individual project evaluation by Google and My Games experts. Second, detailed feedback about the project and analysis of the growth opportunities. Third, marketing, publishing, and project scaling expert advises, um, advice. Uh, fourth, business potential review. And fifth, individual consultations with each studio. In addition, in the second season, My Games and Google offer the following advantages to developers. Number one, unique opportunity for internal benchmarking tasks by Google and My Games. Number two, Google advertising credits for user acquisition testing. And number three, opportunity to receive investments from My Games with an investment pool of up to $30 million. So if you're interested in participating in the campaign, please apply on the website mgvc.com slash game drive. But do not forget... Tomorrow is the last day for your application this year. All right. Today, we'll talk about such topics as product monetization, one of the hardest things for mobile game developers. We have several quite interesting speakers today, but please remember that we're also here to talk to you guys. So do not hesitate to bring your questions to the table and send them to the Q&A chat or in the live stream chat or wherever you guys prefer. Finally, let me welcome our speakers in today's session from My Games Venture Capital and Google. The number um, of the speaker number one is Bagdina Buvaiva, who is a strategic partner manager at Google AdMob. Hi, Bagdina. Hello, Anton. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Very excited to be here. All right. Uh, speaker number two is Michael Isidorov, who is an executive producer at MGVC. Michael? Hey guys, hey Anton, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to talk to you, to share some knowledge with Emmanuel. Thank you. All right, all right, all right. Thank you guys. So without further, further ado, Bagdina, here you go, please. Thanks, Anton. All right, so I'm super excited to be here with you today. It's your final AMA session. And I know your content, your educational content was building up to this project presentation. So we have monetization um, as a final step for your education. So if you go to the next slide, you will see uh, that I work in Google AdMob. 
And my job is to help growing developers just like you to grow sustainably and to monetize better and better. Um, so if you go to next slide, you will see that successful monetization is essential for your business growth. Um, so let's assume that you all have your product, so it's up, live, and running, and you use already the best practices that have been shared before here in our session to benchmark your product metrics, to iterate, to improve. So your product is live and good to go. And let's assume that you already know what market you are targeting. So you understand your user segments, the geo, the demographic, the why users are going to your, to your game. And here comes the trickiest part. Um, as Anton mentioned before, monetization, one of the hardest part, but it's essential for you to find your product market monetization and channel fit in order to grow. If you know about monetization, so it's important to build your monetization from the start. And once it's built, it's important to stay open-minded and test, iterate and experiment in order to optimize it further and further. So that's basically what my everyday here at Google AdMob. So I consult clients, big and small, growing and sustainable uh, apps and games to get to this monetization um, optimization point, right? Uh, to, to help them to be profitable and grow more sustainably. And last but not least, as I said, it's important to combine your monetization fit with channel fit and uh, have positive ROAS. All right, so when the organizers reached out to me for their session, I thought, what can I share with you? What the in the next 20 minutes would be the most useful content to get uh, from me? Uh, if you go to the next slide, I think the most important question uh, that we can discuss with you today it's what do growing developers do differently to grow? So that's the question that I ask myself um, in this role every day. So um, I think uh, throughout the, the years that I've been in this role that some teams, some developers, they grow faster than others. Moreover, they not only grow faster, but they are growing more sustainable than others. So today I'm gonna share uh, with you the three things that in my opinion, the growing developers do differently. So if you go to next slide, uh, I think the most important thing that these developers do is that they have a very, very strong analytics uh, foundation. And they treat everything regarding their product, regarding their monetization, regarding their channel and users as a hypothesis. And they always stay open-minded to test. So you can uh, think of it as a simple stuff. So for example, uh, when you speak to your team, every uh, product um, conclusion, right, or monetization conclusion, you treat exactly as a hypothesis, not as a fact. So, for example, I can hear from people, yeah, full screen apps, they drive away the retention. And when I ask them, okay, what data point do you use to, to, uh, to drive this conclusion? They said, no, we just heard this, we assume. So that's very, very important for your team to understand that with ad monetization, treat everything as a hypothesis until you test it and until you have a data proven um, results to, to have this conclusion. So um, it's important to build a strong analytical foundation to understand and segment your users, to understand how uh, diverse are your users, like why they're coming to your product, uh, what's their engagement and retention metrics. Um, I won't go deeper in it. I know you had like a very, very full session on this before. But I will say that, uh, and reiterate actually, that it's important to benchmark everything uh, in the analytics, including in the ad monetization. Mm. So I suggest to you to ask as many benchmark as you can when you speak to people like me uh, from Google or from any other uh, institutions, organizations that can provide you the data. Uh, so what kind of benchmark you can ask uh, for, for own ad monetization. So first of all, um, you should ask the specific data uh, on your genre. So for example, first question should be, what the uh, monetization split in my genre? So for example, it can be a coloring games, right? What's the split between in-app and ads revenue in general you see? Second question could be, what the ad formats uh, games in this genre or subgenre use? 
um, what's the revenue split between those ad formats, what are the typical gales that drive the most revenue, uh, what uh, are the typical rewarded placements or rewarded ideas uh, for the subgenres. So all of this data is available or could be available. So don't be afraid to ask and um, benchmark uh, to deeper understand what the best practices of monetization in your genre. And yeah, as I said, it's important to treat every monetization option, option as a hypothesis and test learning scale. Um, so if you go to the next slide, there are definitely uh, so, uh, exact solution to provide you um, with this uh, opportunity. So first, for example, uh, there's a Google solution from Firebase, remote config and A-B testing. So these two features can help you to test any product and monetization hypothesis easily without the necessity to update your game. Um, and here you can basically provide different parameter value to different user segments or audiences. And second solution, which is a new solution, it's a beta solution uh, from AdMob. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, it's called impression level LTV ping back. So um, here's a bit uh, revolutionary new news from uh, AdMob that we finally have an opportunity for you to provide you impression level uh, ping back data for your BI system where you can use this data, you can iterate, uh, you can optimize um, and uh, learn how you can improve the LTV uh, metric in your app and game. So these are just two examples. They happen to be Google solution uh, because uh, I, I know better knowledge of them, but I encourage you to stay open-minded and kind of learn and ask for the most uh, recent solutions from, from any, any monetization platform that you're using. Okay, if you go to the next slide, let's suppose you mastered the analytics and tests. So in my opinion, the second thing that uh, the growing developers do differently, they combine different types of monetization, which is in-app and ads. They get the most out of hybrid monetization. They don't uh, just treat their uh, LTV as an app LTV, but they open, but they stay open-minded to user needs and user monetization potential. So, if you go to the next slide, uh, they, um, there is this let's call it myth, right? Uh, that in-app purchases is the best strategy for developers and, and users. But it's important to know now that in average, 96% of users will never spend on in-app purchases. Uh, it depends, of course, from which markets you targeted, this number can uh, vary, but in average, only 4% of your users will ever uh, buy subscription from you or in-app purchases from you. Uh, so it mean, meaning that if you're using only in-app purchases, you are missing out of the opportunity to monetize the majority of the users in the internet today. So if you go to the next slide, you will see uh, here the distribution. So here's like a classic example of the red ocean and the blue ocean. Um, so of course you think that tapping into the large NAP market may be enticing, but it's important to understand that users have limited budget and they uh, all might be already tied up into, into different games. The competition is very high. So as you can see uh, from the chart on the right, that top 1% of the developer make uh, most of the in-app uh, revenue worldwide, right? So here is for you is opportunity to uncover and unleash the ads market and to, to become a uh, profitable and uh, to benefit from the blue ocean opportunity. And actually at the bottom, you will see that a mobile ads revenue uh, is expected to triple by, by this year, basically. So why not compete rather than, uh, uh, why, why not uh, monetize with ads rather than compete with a highly concentrated in-app purchase market? So if you go to the next slide, here's um, opportunity for you to join your peers, to join other game developers that started uh, combining both in-app and ads. So the number of in-app driven games that adopted ads monetization uh, grew up 34% uh, year over year. So let's deep dive into concrete examples. If you go to the next slide, please. 
yeah, uh, here's an example of how your ARPDAO can change, uh, given uh, assuming that only now you are benefiting from in-app only revenue. So uh, let's assume that your existing uh, in-app purchase revenue uh, is uh, five cents, right? Uh, and according to this example, which we used uh, like uh, based on our internal data, ads are our contribution could be uh, one cent or two cents, which is 20 or 40% revenue uplift. Uh, give, uh, and this is only your net revenue uplift. We don't consider a potential retention increase or potential in-app purchase increase, which I will talk later on the example. Um, so long story short, uh, consider uh, ad monetization um, as a way also to increase your overall ARPDAO. So if you go to the next slide, here's an example from our partner Ludia, uh, which is a game developer uh, with over 400 employees and 3 million DAO with eight games. So Ludia, on the next slide, started testing our rewarded ads uh, just to, to test the hypothesis that I was talking to you about. So on the next slide, uh, you will see that Ludia had the following KPIs uh, for the rewarded ads test. Uh, they tracked rewarded ads revenue, they tracked changes of the in-app revenue to avoid cannibalization, and they tracked also user retention, uh, the average number of sessions and session length. So in the next slide, you will see an example how Ludia implemented the rewarded ads. Uh, so here's their game, uh, Jurassic World, uh, and you can see here a uh, screenshot of uh, the store and uh, the ad prompt uh, that says to start watching rewarded ads, which is pretty discoverable. Uh, as you can see, it's important for rewarded ads to be discoverable to the audience, so to be contextually relevant. Uh, second, the uh, rewarded ads here, they're consistent, so they're not intrusive, um, and the design allows seamless integration with overall game experience. And last but not least, the reward that here is valuable. The reward is giving a user an option to start a new battle right, right away. Um, so uh, here is an example of the placement that uh, Ludia tested. And um, running our uh, Firebase A-B testing, on the next slide, you will see the results that they achieved with testing our rewarded ads. So um, the result, their results were fascinating. So first of all, um, the increase in rewarded video ad revenue uh, increased in four times with steady in-app revenue. So there was no cannibalization. Uh, their retention uh, was uh, four times better for ad watchers than non-watchers. Uh, exactly, you heard it correct. <laughs> rewarded ads in this case, uh, they helped to improve the retention because uh, they provided a contextually relevant reward, which prompt user to stay longer in the games and to enjoy the game more. And uh, they also noticed 25% increase in session time for players who watch ads comparing to those who don't. Uh, and 50% of DAO watched at least one ad per day. Um, and overall, um, here's the impact uh, of ad revenue on the in-app revenue. So um, the users were six times more likely to purchase within 24 hours after watching an ad because Ludia provided their users a taste of an app purchase. So a users, this 96% of users who never pay, they tasted the premium content and they were more likely to pay uh, then later. So if you go to the next slide. Um, yeah, we'll go to our final chapter about what do success growing uh, at, uh, developers do uh, to grow. Uh, so I call it like as a way of finding your optimal ad frequency given your product market specifics. So what does it mean? What's ad frequency? So ad frequency, long story short, is how many ads you're showing uh, per your session. Uh, for example, I start my consultation with this question, okay, uh, like I played your game, let's say your session duration is 20 minutes. I saw X number of ads. Why is this number of ads? Like why did you test out this frequency or like how did you come up with this number? If you go to the next slide. Um, yeah, uh, here is an illustration of how all of these metrics are interconnected. So on the Y axis, you see the ARPDAO. 
And on the X axis, you see at precession, also called at frequency. So we see that the more ads you show, um, the uh, more net daily revenue per acquired user you get until a certain point, right? Uh, you see also the red line, which is a retention, uh, which said that, okay, the more ads you, you show to your users, the less retention is. So it comes from an um, uh, assumption that, for example, if you uh, show 100 ads, uh, for user for, I don't know, 10 minutes, of course, they're going to quit your app. We don't want you to bombard your users with app. We never want it. Uh, we just want you to find an optimal balance. Um, as you can see in the middle, so you see where all the three lines interconnect. Um, so that's the point where we want you to go. We want you to be profitable. So you, are, you have a positive uh, ROAS. Um, we want your retention to be maximum. Uh, and we want you to show the optimal number ads per session. So it's important to remember when you think about your mon ad monetization, you remember to, to think about this graph. So on the next slide, you will see uh, what uh, affects ad frequency. So of course, ad frequency depends from many, many factors. So first of all, it depends from uh, different categories or genres, for example, entertainment, games, education, and so on and so forth. They have different product and engagement metrics, this will also, um, and different why, uh, different incentive for users to come back, right? So it's important to remember that um, different categories generally have different ad frequency. Uh, second of all, of course, it depends from users, from their demographics, and also from their GAO. We, according to our internal data, some uh, users from different GAO have different ad tolerance comparing, comparing to others. So I will talk about, about it later. And last but not least, of course, different ad formats have different ad frequency. For example, banner ad would have different ad frequency from rewarded ad, uh, which we talked a bit before. So on the next slide, uh, you will see the example of different ad formats. So they are happen to be from AdMo. Uh, you see traditional ad formats, and you can see three new formats, adaptive banner, reward, and social and app open. So it's important for you, while you think about that frequency, not to consider only traditional ad formats, but also benefit from new uh, ad formats with better user experience. So on the next slide, uh, you will see um, more uh, context to what I said earlier. So um, as I said, different users from different countries, from different territories have, um, might have different um, ad tolerance, right? So in Google, we quote uh, these markets, um, next billion users market. So what's next billion users market? So it's the countries or territories uh, from where we see significant internet penetration growth uh, in the past 10 or 15 years and where we expect the next billion users on to come to internet. So for example, let's say India, you see that from 2015 to 2020, uh, their uh, internet penetration grew from 27% to 50%. So this new users came to the internet and their habits, their preferences were very, very different from the first billion users, right? So it's important for you to remember that the users that you are creating your product for, uh, they might have different expectations, thus different ad tolerance. So on the next slide, here are some common characteristics that next billion users uh, might have. For example, uh, they might have low connectivity, of more offline sessions, higher social media engagement, and they expect uh, video as a key content platform. Uh, because they already came to the internet when video was uh, prevailing. So um, given that, it's important to remember that uh, if you are targeting your users globally, consider to having a custom monetization strategy for each of the GAO. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Yeah, uh, here are key takeaways from what uh, we discussed today. So we started with the question, what do growing ad developers do differently? So I think that first they build a strong analytical foundation. They take a lot of time um, to, to do this. But once you have this muscle, once your team have a habit of testing uh, in a lean way and implementing the uh, hypothesis into your product and monetization, uh, you will be very well uh, set off. Uh, second, 
then they get the most out of in-app and ads. They never treat ads uh, with some, you know, myth or uh, bias, prejudice, uh, but they open-minded and they let the data to show uh, how ads impacting their user retention and not just assumption. And last but not least, they find optimal ad frequency. They understand their users, they understand the flu. And given all that, they get to the point where they are profitable, but yet the retention and all the other metrics are uh, on their maximum as well. Um, that's it for me. Next slide would be just a thank you. Uh, and I'm very excited for your question. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm here passing on to my colleague, uh, Mikhail, who will talk about awesome ways to uh, monetize with uh, offer walls and app purchases. Yeah. Hey again, Bagdina, thank you very much for your exciting presentation. And yeah, here I want to cover another type of monetization that was previously a bit before. It's in-app monetization, the most famous and current ones. And I will try to put main attention on offer system, which is from our, our point of view is a key part of in-app monetization. But first, let's start from the current function of a regular shop in mobile free-to-play games. I think that from, uh, that right now, its main and most important goal is to set the base value to the half currency level and form players' expectations. What is cheap? What is effective to buy? How is it? In, is this offer or is this app interesting or no? And all of this you can see from the base values that you see in your shop. And two other functions, they are really not so important, but that also a place grant whales could spend money in, in your regular store. I will cover it a bit later. And of course, this is place for special offers. So let's go to the next slide. Yeah, in this slide, you can see an example of user spend distribution allocated by source from all the games in my games venture capital portfolio. And we have really a lot of them. And here you can see that common uh, regular shop lots are taken only from 10 to 30% of revenue and other 70 to 90 are really all of the offers that bring to you. That's, this could include battle pass, first purchase board or some triggered offers, classic offer system with cyclical offers, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, yeah, on the, on the graph, you can see just a very good and very exciting example from one of our products. So let's go to the next slide. Here you can see a typical example of a game economy model for a buy free to play product. You can see that, yeah, on the axis there is price per crystals and in app in and uh, in app type, how much money it costs for your user. And you can see that the regular store prices begin with the lowest efficiency rate for users, and it's increasing while increasing the price of an app offer for each. And from the other hand, vice versa, offers price works, works completely different. You are starting from the most cheap, the most cheap in apps with the best price per crystals. We try to convert users and to provide them this, as Bagdina mentioned, this really 4% of users to provide the, them this very good experience of buying something. And yeah, you can see that on a highest 100 USD in up rate, it's not very big difference between the regular store price and offer price. And that's why we mentioned that a regular store could be really a place for Grand Vale users to spend money because that's not a big difference for them. And you see the third line on it, it's promo offers price. What we call here, it's different triggered or one-time offers that really force users to convert into paying users to provide them this experience and really go and try, uh, go and start spending on your games and then increasing their money. Next slide, please. Yeah, there, there I mentioned different main type of offers, how we classify them. The first one is one-time offers. It's really an offer that are, providing, if, that are provided for users one time in their life. And yeah, starter pack is a good example of it, but there are a lot of them. The second one are triggered offers. These are offers that working with user state, is he lack of energy, money, mana, different items, and uh, uh, provided to a user just in time. The third one are cyclical offers, which were mentioned on the previous slide. These offers are working with users on the standard user behavior pattern to provide the best experience for them. They are repeatable and they mainly uh, form this uh, offer system that you can see in a lot of in-app monetized 
mobile games right now. The next one are event offers, and these are offers linked to different time-limited events that could be launched during in the product lifetime for our users. And very close to it, the fifth type, it's world event offers that from our classification are offers linked to world events like New Year, St. Patrick's Day, Halloween that are coming close, etc., etc. And now uh, we want to detail a look into any of them. So next slide, please. On it, you will see the one-time offers type. Yeah, as I mentioned, it meets only once during player lifetime and usually provide a huge discount because it's promotional offers. Also, there could be mentioned some offers, such offers like players reached 10 level, players uh, defeated any different difficult boss. And, our, and the task of these offers is to convert our user to the first payment or sometimes to push him into the higher cohort to, or to make it to higher tier spending level. Next slide. Here we can see triggered offers. As I mentioned, yeah, they, they can be repeated, but can be not. And this usually offers working with user state. So we try to understand that right, what your users need right now, what he wants, what would be the most interesting item for him and trying to make, a, to make this spontaneous emotional payment based on emotional attachment of users. And yeah, you can see that in these offers, on example, sometimes the discount isn't very big because yeah, they are working with some emotional attachment of a player. He wants it right now and he could buy it. Next slide. And here, one moment. Yeah, cyclical offers. They are repeating. They are working on a uh, day-by-day level, depending on your setting apps, how you set up your system how you work with it, what you want from a user right now. They could be repeatable or they, or they could uh, provide you better value time from time to time, but it's forming user payment pattern for our, for our users. And yeah, our, their, main, their target is to make regular repeatable payments and to form your incoming uh, revenue. Next one. Slide, next slide, please. Yeah, event offers. And definitely event offers, they could uh, appear only on the dur duration of an event. They could really ha have different amount of discount from, from the very low to the high ones, depending on the off on the aim of your in-game events. Because yeah, of course, everyone wants to gain to gain to gain uh, to get to get money from a content, but there could be different event goals, for example, to remove some hard currency from a game, to increase user retention, to provide to present some different type of gameplay. And the, all, all your offers could uh, support you in these achievements and activities. Next slide. Yeah, and here we want to share with you uh, the typical criteria from our uh, from our point of view, which could help you to form the, your users cohorts and to, to to set up your system of cyclical offers. What could be really useful for you to to track from a user? Of course, total sum, total sum of all the users' purchases, both with some of the users' purchases for the last period. Because you know, sometimes there are some cases when user, for example, start spending high on, high on your game, but then reach some level and don't want to spend so much amount. And that would be really useful to check how much he spent during the last 30 or 60 days, because yeah, he, he, he can't be ready for 100 USD offer right now, but he could buy your five USD offer with a displeasure. Of course, more maximum users purchase because you need to understand how much this, how much this person, how much is comfort for this player to spend. Because yeah, it could be different. It could be the same amount of all the purchases, but one, but one user could only make one 100 USD purchase, and the other could done it in 20 times five for five dollars. And of course, time since last users, users purchase to form this pattern, to understand. Usually, we recommend to use something like one, three, seven. 14, 30 days on this basis, but of course, anything dependent on your games, on your game, on your test, and on checking hypothesis of your team. Yeah, next slide. And to track all of this, to provide this apart, to, to, to investigate what would be the better criteria for you, how to structure an offers. It's super important to have admin panel that allow you to create new offers, to change existing ones, to uh, experiment with them, to start and stop them just right now, to have this admin panel for an offers. It's super critical because if you need the client or server update to apply any change, it really doesn't feel good from the users. And you need the opportunity to fix something, to apply some very good ideas just right now. 
just by changing some data in admin panel, not without any updates, because you know, sometimes it could wait, could take a long time to apply the updates for your game. Next slide. Yeah, of course, future of offers, because yeah, these offers and monetization is really a place that you, you can't stop uh, any any time, any way to of your experimenting of providing different A-B testing. Magdina mentioned some sources how it's important to make A-B testing and for your in-app monetization, it's super important. Different RFM analysis, of course, and checking new hypothesis with all of your team to understand what would work better, what could be the most interesting content for your users right now, how it's possible to uh, to make to improve any mechanic in your game. Okay, let's go to the next slide. There are would there would be some examples of interesting ideas from our side. What could be the future of an app monetization and offer system? The first one is chain offer. It's this mechanic really starts gaining popularity because it's very interesting for users. And to get to the offer, you need to claim the previous one. Just on this picture, on this example, you can uh, see that there is a very good example of hybrid monetization, like Magdina mentioned. So both in it, you can see a rewarded ads offer, some just free slots to claim it for free and the payment offers. And the last, the most interesting item would be the last on this chain, and it would be characteristic for your users. Again, very good example that both uh, in-app monetization and rewarded type monetization could work together and work uh, be fine for users. This, this was a test from our game Hustle Castle and the results were amazing. And next slide on it, you can see another interesting example of something of something of something good, fresh idea how you can work with your monetization. Again, it's Hustle Castle project, and the team decided to provide user for uh, the starter offer to understand what would be better for these users is different prices and how it could be excited. Uh, uh, every user could choose something, the best option for them by themselves. And that's very interesting for them. And yeah, it provided very good results. Okay, next slide. I think it's the one of the last. Yeah, here at MGVC, we are continuously working on, uh, the, on our monetization approach among all our studios, all our products, and try to share any successful idea, any successful case be, be, uh, between all of them, trying to hold on different experiments with interesting kind of projects, and really search and find the best solution for each genre. Because, yeah, I think Bagdina also mentioned this, depending on the genre, your offer system, your different setting apps could be completely different, and you need to iterate, and you need to check all the hypothesis here to find what's the best for you and how you can really make it interesting for your audience because the audience is the key for it. I think that's all from my side. Thank you very much and I would be happy to answer your questions and there or any comments how or just ask something for us. Yeah and again as Anton mentioned we are waiting for your projects on the MGVC.com game drive and please present it to us and we would be happy to detail a look through it. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. And thank you, Bagdina. This was amazing. This was very helpful. And I hope you guys have been listening and, you know, uh, getting the most of it. So, yeah, now it's time for the Q&A. And uh, I'm going to pass the mic. Well, first, again, do not hesitate to ask your questions. We have lots of time for that so far. So, please, it's your chance to, you know, use our experts time uh, uh, to, to, you know, to get the answers to your questions. So to, 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 to get the most out of them. So I'm going to pass the mic to the Zaftercast guys. Uh, we have some questions from the audience. So please guys. Okay. That. All right. Uh, I also wanted to reiterate one thing uh, from myself because uh, we also had one question about uh, uh, is application to game drive is still available and yeah, it's still available until tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow is the last day. But one thing that I wanted to ask Arian is like, how much time would it take to uh, fill out the application? I mean, like, is it going to be like uh, 10 minutes or half an hour or two hours? How much data should you prepare for that? And uh, what kind of uh, data kits or assets you should prepare for that? I mean, how much time does it take? And everyone is like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Visible okay. frustration. Okay. <laughs> okay. But uh, I really hope that uh, someone would uh, return to me with this kind of uh, answer. 
uh, but uh, for now, uh, it's a question for Bagdina, I guess. Uh, the first one is um, uh, from our listener, it's Dmitry, and he's asking, I'm a monetizer in a Play Core, a small mobile game publisher that uh, makes mid-core and casual mobile games. And recently we got banned from AdMob for a reason that can't be related to us, hacking, because we're no hackers. Uh, the appeal was rejected without explaining the reason for the ban, and it's possible. Is it possible to talk to someone to find out anything? Is it possible to uh, talk uh, to someone in AdMob, uh, like uh, middleman management or something? Uh, and AdMob has a very important place in our waterfall. The question itself is how can a young publisher uh, talk to an AdMob manager, get advice, and learn how to avoid mistakes if we're making them? Thank you very much for the question. Um, thank you, Dmitry. First of all, nice to meet you. Um, congrats on uh, having your mobile game, uh, working at the Play Core, right, a small game uh, publisher. So first of all, um, that's a great question. That's what we hear also to provide you how to be proactive on this question. So your, I think you have two questions here, right? So first of all, how a young growing um, game studio can talk to uh, monetization managers like me in AdMob. And second is about policy, about your case. Um, so let me uh, start by in, in first one, uh, how to talk to AdMob. Um, so unfortunately, our resources as for now are very limited. So we select the publisher that we talk to, that we take to our book of business proactively. Um, so, but we reach out uh, in the beginning of quarter, right? So usually we would contact a person on their uh, AdMob uh, email, uh, but we do have a lot of scaled activities for developers just like you. Uh, so first of all, we do our webinars, AdMob webinars. I will ping the uh, link to the chat if, the host allow, allow us. Uh, so we do like at least six webinars per quarter in different languages. I personally drive uh, uh, webinars for, in Russian. So yeah, so uh, there is a special place where you can follow our webinars and get in touch with us on this kind of live streams. Second, there's AdMob community user forum. I will also send a link. Um, so I hope that answer your first question. Uh, yeah, our host wants to say something, I think. No? No, okay. Um, <laughs> we good. Um, so, yeah, so that's the first part, right? Uh, so hopefully we will reach out to you proactively. Second part that you mentioned is about the ecosystem. So I'm so sorry what happens to you that they were hacked and something out of your control. Um, uh, however, it's, it's um, important to understand how the system works, right? So AdMob consists of uh, three main stakeholders. First is of course, is developers, you publishers. Um, there's advertisers and uh, there's users. So there are unfortunately many frauds going on in ad uh, monetization right now um, that want to hack and risk our system, right? So our trust and safety team, the team, the policy team, they have sophisticated tool to identify the um, ad fraud activity. And it could happen that your AdMob, AdMob account could be impacted. Maybe maliciously you didn't know some rules, right? Um, and uh, it happened that you were affected. But I will send you a link uh, to resources called Ad Traffic Control Center. There are some things that you can do proactively to prevent it. Um, so I see our host looking at me a bit suspiciously. Maybe I'm taking too much time. Um, so yeah, um, hopefully that will help. I will be pinging the links. Um, and yeah, I, ho I hope to talk to you and I wish all uh, the growth to play core to your, uh, uh, to your team. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the next question is um, really yep. like, you know, super common question. Go ahead, Max. Yes, uh, it's from our listener. Apple is restricting data collection a lot right now. How does it after affect benchmarking and monetization analytics, especially if I'm new to the free-to-play freemium market? Should I maybe choose Android for my soft launch? Hello. So, Dmitry, it was a nice question, I can say, because I have been reading a lot of articles per day that try to talk for us something about uh, new post ID for error, everything will be good, everything will be bad, but you can't find any numbers anyway, any figures. So, um, uh, 
usually I start my day from opening uh, our analytic tools and I can convert facts into numbers. I can say that Apple restricted the count of data for machine learning algorithm of platforms and they lost uh, some effectiveness in buying traffic. It brought rising in CPM and cost per uh, thousand for 30 to 60 percentages, I can say. And we see that all niches in all countries uh, meet the same problem. Uh, and all companies meet the same problem. However, for small companies, it is more critical. Impact is feel more strongly by smaller companies um, because small companies don't have enough cash, cash to test different strategies and don't have a chance to make a mistake. And to be honest, uh, no one knows right now anything about the possibility uh, to back to previous numbers. So uh, to make a soft launch on Android is a good strategy right now. You will get, I uh, prefer usually Android right now nothing else you will get more data and a clear picture of uh, user behavior especially of the first time user experience period and more data means more data driven decisions and i don't see any alternatives right now so how i hope i thank give you a full answer yeah. hey, thanks uh, very good uh, answer uh, the next question is also platform specific. Uh, how does the platform affect the spending pattern of a user? Say PC, Android, iOS, should they think about some sort of platform specific micro correction in my monetization models? Yeah, I think let me answer on it because yeah, it's a very interesting question. And of course, yeah, you need to keep in mind, I think not the difference of a platforms, but mainly different payment patterns on this on these platforms and especially user behavior. So for example, yeah, we understand that for PC games, players usually try to spend really long time sessions and with mobile platforms, it's a bit, they are much more faster and that's why you need to play to, uh, to plan your offers, how it would be better in terms of platform. And yeah, in general, we could advise that on mobile platforms, like I mentioned, there is users are really attached to some sometimes emotional emotional uh, offers that is interesting to them to buy. So you can try to work with user state and, uh, for example, some uh, one time offer that would be triggered, and vice versa for PC. That's a good time. That could be just subscription for VIP for a month that provide you some. Uh, benefits as a user but in general yeah it all depends mainly i think not on the platform but on your game genre because for rpg butler or and for example for master game there would be completely different patterns and uh, for example for shooters they would be the third but and but both uh, rpg and shooters they could be run on all of the platforms and your game could be cross-platform hope i answer this Okay. Okay. I guess it was really comprehensive. So uh, the other question that we had from our listener is that um, a lot of games are monetized through several ad formats in uh, instantaneously, and it's kind of annoying, really. So it's like different uh, ad formats, and they are uh, being, uh, mm, uh, I would say that they are implemented uh, in one app, and sometimes they are even, you know, overlapping one each other. So. You talk about the ad tolerances. Is a number of different ad formats should be considered asymmetric too? That's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, so first of all, um, short answer to your question. Yes, uh, the number of ad formats um, that you use in your app, it's definitely a metric. It's definitely something to work on, to improve on, to test on. Um, that's for sure. Uh, it's important for you to build your so-called multi-format strategy, right? If, if there are not only, let's say, your top format is rewarded, but also you have interstitial full screen apps or banner apps and so on and so forth. Um, so let me tackle, if you don't mind, uh, the point that you mentioned about being annoying. So this is an, an emotional description, which I suppose my... Uh, lead to some concrete metrics. So for example, if you say annoying, uh, let's assume what the implication could be. The, your user rating could drop right on your store or your churn metric could um, um, increase. So all of this 
emotional characteristic is a good indication for you to track. So if you think that some ads are annoying, please make sure you're tracking uh, the KPIs. And while experimenting with your ad format strategy, multi-ad format strategy, uh, make sure that you track what was the impact of different ad formats. But honestly, from your questions, I think you kind of don't trust different ad formats. Um, however, yeah, if you don't mind, let me challenge you. Um, if any of this based on concrete numbers, I uh, yeah would be would love to hear if you want, uh, feel free to ping to the question. But um, again, as I said in my presentation, it's important to define what is kind of our assumption and what is based on our data on our users. Because you definitely have to look into the numbers. How do they work? I mean, like, especially if you uh, use like three, four, five ad formats in your app, and if you show lots of them, then you could see that some that your attention drops or that some people are just deleting your app. So maybe you are just overdoing that. So you have to look into the numbers. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But um, if you don't mind, let me uh, play devil's advocate here. But it also could be that none of these metrics um, effect of course depends from your genre right if for example in in the previous question there was a um, hardcore uh, game developer right of course like for this kind of games the ad tolerance will be so much different but if it's mostly um, let's say ad friendly genre and your users there's opportunity also to test with different ad formats um, of course I never want your attention to drop if ads negatively impacting your retention metrics don't do them or try to find the balance. But I think what I'm, what my everyday job is here in AdMob is to challenge and make sure that all your assumption here, they are exactly based, based on data and tasks. So for example, what I do in my consults, uh, we take um, the sub genre and we see, okay, your peers are using the four ad formats. Here's the rough share and you using only one um, uh, ad format, right? So the assumption is that if you're using, if you will use additional ad formats, the assumption is your revenue overall will grow. So why not test them? And we have many, many successful cases when we helped uh, developers to be more profitable and to grow. Um, so yeah, so I think it's more about uh, balance and some concrete, concrete numbers, but yeah, feel free to challenge or share more examples. Okay, thanks. Uh, really comprehensive. So the other question that uh, we wanted to ask is that, uh, you know, it's kind of like a casual question. So maybe, uh, I don't know who, who's going to be answering that about how are um, in-app purchases bundles are being calculated? I mean, like Call of Duty bundles or something like that. For example, how, how the prices have been calculated? What's either big or are they small? So, hello again. I can say that is a very, very deep topic. It's like a, uh, like a, you should be a scientist to try to know everything about that. However, um, in a few words, when we're talking about bundles, a good way is to find uh, elasticity of a price and uh, its impact on uh, your, I don't know, percentages of payment and so on. And... Uh, there are no silver bullet here. Only one way to measure impact is to make a lot of tests. Yeah, it's the right way. However, there are two strategies when we're talking about bundles and special offers. Uh, the same amount of money, but more goods that you put into bundle and less money, but the same volume of goods. And there you should ask yourself what impact you want to meet. I mean, what numbers you are going to increase percentage of payment or average check. The first one, we're talking about the same amount of money, you will need uh, increasing of average check. And when we're talking about less money, but the same volume of goods, you will increase percentage of payments. So that's, that's all I can say right now, maybe. Okay, I guess, thanks. thanks. So the other question that um, we wanted to reiterate is that uh, about how much time it actually takes to fill the submission form uh, for game drive. I mean, like uh, how much data should you provide? 
Uh, what kind of data should you provide? And is it like 10 minutes or half an hour or two hours? Hello, Hatram is here, executive producer at NGVC, and I will ask this question. So actually it takes to fill in the information just a couple of minutes. You need to provide us a link to the Google Play of a game. Also, you need to provide us with the gameplay video of your game, for example, on YouTube or other system. And also, uh, it will be excellent if you provide us with a doc with the information about your team, about your product, about your assets, maybe, and so on. So uh, the much information uh, you will send, then it will be easier. Uh, easier for us to uh, to take a, a decision about your game and evaluate your metrics, your assets, your game, and uh, other information that you provide us with. I think that's it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank so you. I guess it's going to be like half an hour and uh, you have to have uh, at least a video of gameplay. So that's like the biggest thing that you should uh, uh, I think, yes, prepare. you're right. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Exactly. So, uh, Anton, actually, yeah. we had a question that is uh, mostly about uh, your expertise here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, guys. So, um, um, the the question we have, uh, apart from the YouTube stream, is that may I ask the link for the record? Because the content is worth watching again and again, and this is completely true. And uh, we have just dropped the YouTube link to the Zoom chat so you can uh, see all the previous hammers. They're already there. And this one, this particular one, will be available very soon. So please uh, follow, the, follow the YouTube channel. Everything is there. All right. We have some more questions. Uh, again, thank you, Zoftrocast guys, for starting this up. And the next one is... When do we start integrating uh, the offer system? So Misha, if you could help us out with that. Sure. Yeah, again, it's a very interesting question. And here, the, fir the first part of answer would be, of course, it's dep it depends on your team, your product roadmap, how you will see the game development and all of this. But from our side, we could recommend that after the initial monetization test, so when your product is entering soft launch stage, it would be good for you to have some minimal amount of different type of offers to test the monetization. Because right now, audience is really uh, very, very high appreciated of different uh, sales offers and etc. And the game without them would really would not provide the metrics you want for it. So let's call it, I think, a uh, soft launch after the initial monetization test and the retention tests. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, so much. Our, we have a next one. And guys, again, do not hesitate to, uh, uh, to ask your questions uh, either in Zoom or in YouTube channels. Uh, the colleagues here are exactly for the sake of answering them. So the next one would be, uh, what is the most important? What are the most important offer metrics to keep track of? So, um, Dima, can you okay, help us? At, yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, we have uh, two group of questions here, like a small group about uh, their offer, and uh, you should uh, measure count of payment percentage of payment of this offer but uh, i met another good question about is it possible to mesh up monetization by using offers and that is another uh, huge group of metrics just do not for forget about your project revenue about your project average payment per user and so on it's important to ch always check uh, the whole numbers not only uh, impact of uh, current offer yeah, just maybe. And uh, let's t t take the second question about offer smash and optimization. Is it possible to mesh up? Sure. Yeah, and it's very easy. Like to, um, and uh, the most popular case that I see when offers 
in uh, the field of responsibilities of marketing and the marketing team uh, doesn't check the ideas about uh, game designers and they can break i don't know uh, they can break flow of gaming for example give too much discounts for epic armor and epic weapons and that is a huge problem so always check as i said before impact for whole project yeah maybe that's all if you have any special cases you can uh, write them and i will try to find uh, special metrics for your case yeah. all right all right thank you zima uh he can help you find the special metrics guys uh here comes the next one how many unique offers can be present in a successful free-to-play game so does anyone want to volunteer to answer that yes i can answer this one so All speaking right. about the number of unique offers you know it's it maybe hardly so even thousands of different offers because you know it it uh, uh there will be change a lot depending on the behavior of your users. So if the, the behavior is changed, or for example, you released an event, uh, a time limited event or something else, the offers will be changed according to the balance of the event or if the balance of the game was changed, uh, for example. Uh, so, uh, in cumulative aspect, it will be hundreds or even more events in uh, in the game in uh, in a lifetime of a game. I mean, in a lifetime, yeah. And uh, and also your offer system. I think it should be uh, developed uh, all the time. So I think that we can try different approaches and to understand uh, what offers uh, work best for your audience and so on. So we should iterate with the tests, A, B, tests, and so on. OK. Maybe, okay. And, and maybe Michael or and Dimitri will add something on this note. No, I think you completely answered on this question. So, and yeah, again, we could jump on a big discussion and long discussion about it, but in general, yeah, that uh, sounds like this. Yeah, guys, we don't really have a lot of time for the long discussion, but thank you so much for this, Artem. And Misha, I have another one for you. So, some forms of monetization are under active fire right now, especially in-app monetization, in-app purchases uh, in premium games and in-app purchases in general in some countries. So it would be interesting to hear your perspective on this and what will change if lawmakers will restrict, restrict sorry, um, in-app monetization. Yeah, very good question. Of course, we also are trying to monitor all of these legal issues that are coming through there. I can't tell you that it's mainly about an app purchases because from our point of view, I think on the fire right now are loot boxes. It's of course a famous type of an app purchases. I think the most popular one. And yeah, there are really a lot of questions about it on different territories, but also there are some ways how how the guys trying to solve it. For example, right now in the territories where, where it is impossible just to sell, to sell loot boxes, you can sell some hard currency for a game and then add the loot box as a present. Also, what is perspective? Of course, yeah, working on this, on some other type of monetization. Everyone right now understands how popular became battle pass, different battle pass mechanics in free-to-play mobile games, which don't uh, provide these questions, which is really highly accepted by users and interesting for them. 
Another interesting way is like Bagdina mentioned, 96% of audience don't want to make an app purchase, but you can monetize them with ad monetization. And they could bring you some part of revenue. And of course, everyone here knows a lot of titles which are driven mainly by uh, rewarded ads monetization, not an app. And that's a reality right now, the reality of 2021 in app monetization and hybrid monetization, both with it are also a way. And, but yeah, it seems like the, in app monetization, different hypotheses, different ideas would be changing more and more to provide better experience for our users and we will see how it would work. So try to experiment, as we mentioned, try to A-B test, look for interesting ideas, battle paths are interesting mechanic. Uh, rewarded ads is a very useful way of monetization. Uh, give me one minute uh, sure. some additional sure. information. I'm a fan of game history. I can say that in the 30s in the United States, uh, pinball, you know, the pinball, yeah? Uh, it was, pinball was restricted as a gambling game, but pinball didn't have anything else. Uh, pinball had only one button and one stick for pushing a ball. Then game developers, yep, they made flips for pinball and it started defined as a skill-based game. Now it is, a, it is not a gambling, so now we are here. Everyone will try always to restrict uh, our will to, for entertainment, but it's impossible for me right now. It's just, uh, we will always find how to make interesting games and how to sell games for players. Yeah. That does sound reassuring. Um, thank you guys. Thank you so much. This has been insightful. Uh, so it seems that we have answered all the questions. Again, you still have time, guys. Please do ask them. Uh, do not hesitate. Do not be afraid to do that. The guys are ready to answer any kind of question today. And we have one final uh, thought from Bagdina uh, on ad monetization. So please do that. Share your knowledge. Thank you, Anton. Uh, thank you all. Um, yeah, it's been great experience to, to hear from you. I had several questions. Um, however, if you allow me to assume, I understand there's a feeling towards ad monetization with a bit suspicious, right? Um, that before my question was that, um, you know, ads can be annoying and so on and so forth. So I want to share with you two thoughts, just to think about it. Um, so first of all, it's about how our industry, and not just as us, right, um, as, as Google, as other big players, but overall, I think, as an internet industry, um, I think we failed to explain the user that the content is not free. Yes, of course, it's at fund, it's free. However, you as developers, your teams, you put lots of long hours, you put lots of effort uh, into content creation, and it's only fair that you get rewarded for this, right? So nowadays users don't, most users don't get um, tr trouble. They don't uh, get some suspicion when they ask to pay for Netflix or for any streaming services, let's say, I don't know, 14 years per month, right? For, for free content. But when it comes to uh, apps and games, uh, we ha still have some uh, stereotypes or biases, right? So just something to think about as, as an industry. Uh, so uh, that's the first thing. And second thing, I also um, want to share that uh, the policy issue that we discussed before, the ecosystem health, it's important, it's fundamental. However, uh, don't think that it's out of your control and it's a black box. Uh, there are ways for you to be proactive. We have lots of details. I pinned to the chat um, uh, help center article, just one, but there are much more. Uh, you can see the link built, built inside. Um, so basically, long story short, if you are a um, good will developer, if you want to play fair games and you have no intention to break any rules, basically you have nothing to be afraid of uh, when you do ad monetization. Um, so yeah, just two thoughts from me. Um, but overall, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you. I hope you all apply to this great, great acceleration and hope sometimes I can uh, speak to you uh, further on. All right. All right. Thank you, Bagdina. Uh, thank you so much. So inspiring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I really hope that uh, uh, 
many uh, publishers uh, and as many uh, little game developers are going to be participating in this program because actually it's a really good way as especially to begin your path even if you had some failures in the past uh, and right now you are testing out like your third game or fourth game or fifth game or something and you just don't know what to do that's a really good way to start up your career uh, in the game dev uh, to uh, get help from a really good developers from really good publishers from really big companies who are going to share their expertise going to share their resources and that's really cool yeah so i guess we're gonna wrap it up and uh, i guess uh, today was really really cool i got lots of really cool insights myself i made some screenshots <laughs> yeah i i think uh today's session uh, was uh, very helpful if you're a beginner in this uh, or you're a more advanced developer and you know your ropes uh, and how monetization works still great insights and i think a lot of good questions too for our speakers to answer so time well spent yep so yeah, we're guys. gonna you. Uh, it's it's gonna be really cool if you look into the recordings. Uh, so uh, you're gonna uh, you can look into our uh, YouTube channel from Zaftrocast uh, because we're gonna have the translated version of this uh, uh, AMA session, and it's gonna be in Russian. And if you want the original one, you can use the My Games YouTube channel, and there is an original version in English. You guys didn't have to make screenshots. Come on, you, you, you're going to have the recording as well. Um, all right. All right. Thank you guys all so much. Uh, thank you to our experts. Uh, thank you to the viewers. And of course, thank you to the translators. Thank you to all who participated in today's AMA session. And special thanks uh, to our Zaftrocast and AT level uh, colleagues and partners. Uh, we had some amazing insights today, and we sincerely hope that each one of the AMA sessions uh, we had during September and October will be of use and of help to you guys when you develop your mobile game. Um, and before we end our final session today, let me remind you that you still have one more day to submit your mobile game for the game drive project. So if you're a mobile game developer who has your project already published on Google Play and you're looking for support or consulting or investments, this is your chance to submit your project on mgvc.com slash game drive. You have the link, you have the QR code. Oh, you already don't, sorry. But again, <laughs> uh, mgvc.com slash game drive. And you will receive a comprehensive scope of expert evaluation and maybe even investments, who knows? So again, thank you so much. Thanks uh, to all of you guys who have prepared this and to all of you who've been watching us. So have a great day. Have a great evening. Uh, stay healthy. This has been Anton Karadetsky from Player One, my game. So have a beautiful evening. Thank you so much. And see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, see you guys.